Hello, this is Nick from Break Press Games, and today I want to talk about how I structured my open table campaign. Okay, so in my last video, I did 10 tips on how to run a successful open table campaign. And uh, by my standards, it did really well. It got some engagement on DCC Rocks on Facebook and on the uh, DCC RPG Reddit. And so uh, some questions came up as to people wanting to know how I structured my campaign. And so I figured I would do a video talking about exactly that. Now, before we get into the structure of my campaign, we're going to talk about the most commonly discussed type of open table campaign, which is the West Marches campaign. The West Marches campaign was something uh, developed by a gentleman by the name of Ben Robbins. And uh, uh, the three key points of the West Marches campaign were there was no regular time. Every session was scheduled by the players on the fly. There was no regular party. Each game had different players drawn from a pool of around 10 to 14 people. And there was no regular plot. The players decided where to go and what to do. It was a sandbox game in the sense that's now used to describe video games like Grand Theft Auto minus the missions. So... Uh, real quick before we get into my eight uh, structural points is I'm going to say that uh, number one uh, there was no regular time I don't do that uh, there was no regular party yes I invite uh, at least ten people and uh, everything is based upon how many people show up and and who was there last time and then three there was no regular plot the players decide where to go uh, Grand Theft Auto minus the missions for me I have an overarching backstory. There are villains and activities that are taking place uh, in the background, and whether the players choose to engage with that is up to them. But things are happening, and so those things are, are different. Also, uh, the note about minus the missions, I definitely have missions. So, uh, with that being said, um, well, let's break down how I structure mine. Number one, set time and place. I've mentioned in other videos that I have ADHD and have struggled with executive function. Uh, so there are certain things in my life that need to be routine or else I will just go wherever the winds take me. And having players scheduling things for me is not going to work. Uh, so every other Wednesday from 6 to 9 p.m., I know that I have to have the living room clean, I have to have snacks, I have to have pencils and dice. Everything needs to be set in advance. That's what's important for me. So in, in the sense of how the West Marches is set up, uh, yeah, this is, this is not a West Marches campaign in that sense uh, in any way, shape, or form. I need a set time. That's just how my brain works and how my life has to operate. Um, so number two, the town of Stennard is the glue that binds the campaign together. So uh, location-based play is something that gets uh, referenced from time to time in various videos. I know uh, Ben Milton at Questing Beast uh, references location-based play uh, frequently. This is something that I think is one of the key elements. I use uh, Stennard, which is a town that I developed, uh, it is detailed uh, in this zine, the Stennard Courier Volume 1. It was introduced in The Precipice of Corruption, which is what that cover art is behind me. Um, but uh, having a place that kind of is the hub that everyone is drawn to, I think is a really important factor because it gives an explanation as to why the PCs all know each other and how they've come to congregate. And we're going to talk about that more in one of the other points. So number three, the NPCs have wants, needs, friends, enemies, and plant seeds for future sessions. So I'm going to talk about the Standard Courier once again, and we will flip to Jow and Elmonger, who uh, runs, is the pri proprietor of the Old Barn Tavern. In his list of, I actually detail out uh, rumors for each of, uh, each of my uh, NPCs, and in these rumors, they talk trash about people that they hate, they say nice things about the people that they like, they introduce jobs, which is where, where the missions can come in, and overall, um, they are where any type of information dump that I want to give about the world, 
those little seeds that are going to grow into uh, into you know the the plot hooks and campaign points and all those things that uh, will come along the way. Those things are all introduced by the various NPCs that I have developed for the uh, town of Stenner. So, number four, the PCs have come to town because of an event or events, helping to explain drop in and drop out. So, what is that all about? Well, the town of Stenard is being punished with, a, with torrential rains that have caused widespread famine. And this has caused people to be displaced and is a great explanation for why a bunch of zero-level peasants are milling about and wandering in and out of town. This is a very convenient explanation for why uh, uh, a player's characters would be there one week and not be there the next. They probably got a job or are uh, somewhere looking for food and then wander back at a convenient time. So, uh, number five, new PCs start at zero level. I don't care about differing levels. This is something that I know uh, really you know, chafes some people that uh, have modern gaming sensibilities, uh, whereas I grew up in uh, the 80s playing AD&D where it was normal for a party to be composed of characters of multiple, multiple different levels. And I also hate the idea of rewarding players for not showing up. So their PC is going to stay at zero level as long as it makes sense for them to be zero level. Uh, yeah, and I also make sure that each of my, because of a high character death, I make sure that each of my players has at least two characters. So every session usually starts uh, with everybody like settling in, opening up the bags of chips, and rolling up a couple of additional zero levels because there's going to be some death. Uh, so, number six, play begins where the group left off. This is usually a communal space, but sometimes it's on a cliffhanger. So, uh, I structure things so that uh, the session is going to play in two to two and a half hours, uh, so that uh, you know I don't have people staying here all night because uh, they all have lives and uh, have you know hired babysitters and have jobs that they need to go to the next day and what have you and so keeping them much past nine o'clock is not desirable so i want play to be completed in that two to two and a half hour time slot so uh yeah uh i make sure that the uh sessions usually end at a convenient point uh, i'm going to talk next about uh uh different zines that I have written that are encounters that play in uh, two to two and a half hours. Uh, but that being said, occasionally there are cliffhangers and I have written into adventures like uh, The Precipice of Corruption uh, various points where it makes sense that you would find prisoners and oh, hey, there's a, a logical explanation as to why a, a new PC uh, because of a player that uh, you know missed last session and now they're here, why their PC suddenly shows up. Uh, this is something that you should use in your own games. Uh, have the players stumble upon a cell and that's where the new PCs are or they're tied up in the next room that you're, that the uh, PCs are going to wander into. This is a very easy way. Or they jump out of a bush. Um, I've used all of those. It doesn't matter. Uh, the important thing is that uh, you get the new PCs into play as fast as possible so that everybody can have enjoyment and engage in the game. You want everybody to play. Uh, so number seven, elaborate encounters can work better than full adventures. Uh, the Precipice of Corruption got spread out with this particular group, with my open table group, across four sessions. And so they went to the covered bridge depicted be, uh, behind me. Uh, there was a bunch of character death they lost four characters and they <laughs> retreated straight back to the town uh then they went back in and then they had to have a cliffhanger and then another cliffhanger and then the boss fight and now they are back at town but what i use a lot of now are zines like uh wide-eyed terror or pamphlet adventures uh like desperation of the hungry where these are small missions that are an elaborate encounter that is going to take you know an hour and a half two hours two and a half hours 
And I find that writing these bite-sized chunks, it creates a beginning and a middle and an end that is a satisfying session for somebody uh, where it's it's not necessarily, it, it, it can be played as a one-shot, but it's all tied into the town of Stenard. And so it all feels like a part of this big cohesive thing. And so this is a lot of what I do in order to keep all, even though all the players aren't at every session, they all feel that connection because it all goes back to Stenard. Now, lastly, number eight, keep rewards small, focus on info and peer acknowledgement. So because I run Grimdark Play, they are going to walk out of an adventure with a, uh, a, a handful of copper, a, uh, a couple of dried grubs, and uh, some herbs in a pouch, and uh, maybe a rusty shield. In fact, in the last uh, adventure after the big boss fight, they actually got some copper and some silver and a rusty shield and a short sword, and they were overjoyed. And they went back to town to the old barn tavern and... Red mash for everyone. And what's red mash? It is a mix of cranberries, uh, rhubarb, and uh, mashed typha root. All things that will still grow in extremely wet conditions. Uh, so, that being said, you know, that's, for me, the big rewards and the things that really get people pumped are information and that pure acknowledgement. So, information, they walked out of the big boss fight uh, but a bunch of the villains had escaped, and so now they've got this cult of of, of, uh, of nefarious individuals that they, they want to know more about. Uh, they uh, uh, have a bunch of other seeds that have been planted by the various NPCs, uh, so a bunch of other things for them to explore. And then I mentioned that at the end of my sessions, uh, that peer acknowledgement I have, uh, each of the players go around the table and talk about the thing that somebody else did that was their favorite moment of the night uh, in order to reinforce one uh, each of the players' uh, characters being active and engaging in things and getting wild and doing fun stuff, but also reinforcing and uplifting each other by sharing those moments with each other. So that info and that peer acknowledgement. And so that is how I've structured my open table campaign. You know, now we are uh, uh, entering into session number seven and they are super excited to go after the Orange Coven, the cultists from the uh, Precipice of Corruption and kind of, uh, kind of the nefarious actors that are in the uh, whole backdrop of uh, Stenard. So that is how I've been structuring my open table campaign. You know, what's going to happen in the next session is going to be defined by the players uh, because it's going to depend on who shows up and what they want to do. Uh, but, you know, these, these events and machinations are going on at all times in the background. And I consider that part my responsibility. And whether they want to engage with that or not is neither here nor there. Things are happening. And that's the one of the important things. Uh, and it gives them something to engage with if they choose or choose not to. So that is it. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. Uh, you can support Breaker Press Games on DriveThruRPG, on Patreon, uh, through our web store. Uh, all of that helps. So please, uh, you know, like, share, subscribe. And uh, if you think that these these adventures and uh, this story, uh, or I should, this uh, town, sound cool, you know, check those out uh, through your favorite place to buy Dungeon Crawl Classics content. Uh, and finally, uh, I one of the things that uh, was written into the script that I forgot to in, uh, mention is that I recorded a video about uh, making your own town and using the story tools that are presented in the TV show Midnight Mass that was a, uh, a Netflix exclusive. I highly recommend that. I have a... 20 minute long video where I talk about Midnight Mass uh, and so I'm going to link that in the card so check that out if that sounds interesting to you it is 
yeah, I, I think that it is a great study in how to build your own town uh, full of uh, action and intrigue and what have you. So uh, check that out. Uh, once again, thank you for supporting indie games and indie game designers. This is Nick from Breaker Press Games signing off. Thanks and have a good week. I will see you next time.